Hello there, everyone, and thank you for rejoining me here in Red Dusk. I'm your host, Mr. Uh, Socialist Republic of Vietnam lover. But we have a united party. Comrades, I understand that our country is currently facing numerous challenges in times like these. We must come together and collaborate to overcome these difficulties and build a resilient nation. Despite the adversity, unity is our strength, and by working together, we can navigate through these trying times. Simultaneously, beneath the surface of the conference, a hushed undertone emerged, just quiet enough to remain inconspicuous. Within the subdued ambience, dissenting voices find expression. It's ironic. The national economy is struggling, and he persists in not embracing appropriate reforms. It's as if he's detached from the economic realities we're facing. Unbelievable. The corruption situation is worsening. The anti-corruption campaign seems like a useless fire serving no purpose other than pacifying the people, and after all that, he's rambling about the meaningless things instead of addressing the issue. What do we clear? He's undermining our socialist government by compromising with the Gorbachevit. This is entirely unacceptable. We need strong leadership that can stand firm against internal external threats. Despite these sentiments, as the General Secretary concluded his speech, a resounding applause erupted throughout the auditorium. The collapse, though, perhaps tinged with undertones of disagreement, echoed the complex sentiments within the diverse delegates, or does it? And we continue to lose more political power with party infighting, so basically we just got slightly more stability from where we were earlier. But with cooperate with economic sectors. So we got a lot done here. But, uh, iron modernization might not be bad, but are we, do we at least have some good... No, we have no consumer goods. Okay. Yeah, we're stuck in a pickle. Um, uh, but we're in cooperation with economic sectors. And, uh, you know, we're just going to keep going this way and do the military stuff later. So. Oh, when does this year have to be? 2006, huh? Southeast Asian Mutual Economic Assistance Organization. And we're, for some sole reason, we're still war with the Pacific Defense Pact, so... And we're going to allow party members to engage in private businesses. Well... We're going to lose some stability, but oh well. It is what it is. I wish we could, like, send volunteers, but we're at war. So, which sucks. Are you going to reunify, maybe? That's a lot of divisions in Korea. Um, so we can't build. We can't do anything, basically. Uh -huh. Oh, and we need a skilled labor force, which would be nice. Yeah, maybe we'll do that one first. Do we have any consumer goods? No. We cancel the lease. Are we missing anything? Uh, some self-propelled artillery. It's the main battle tanks. Interesting. Self-propelled artillery. Tanks. We need some steel, but we can't trade for anything because we're kind of screwed and stuck here. Um. And we don't even make any political power, so it's not all good. Oh, look at that! Saddam proclaims Greater Iraq. A new take on pan-Arabism. Look at that. Very cool. Oh. And the Great Middle Eastern War. Okay. But what about the oil? I wish I could send volunteers. Greater Iraqi Arab Republic. Oh, Sudan. Pope Wujdullah taps away. Oh, boy. Well, that's not good. Oh, hello. North Korea, of course, Kim Jong-il. We will gladly take more resources. As you know, we can use them. Oh, hello. Looks like someone's trying to bomb us there or something. And then a lot of party members. So now we gotta wait about a year for this one. Industrialization, 20 years. Wow, 3,000 days, wow. I mean, that'd be nice, but we can't even, like, use that construction speed. <coughs> oh! Foundations of the Southeast Asia Mutual Economic Assistance. Throughout its history, ASEAN has consistently positioned itself in opposition to our interests, from its very inception up until the present day. The organization's actions and policy are in contrary to our objectives and aspirations, making it a significant challenge in regional affairs, however. Recent developments, notably the fall of Thailand, have brought about significant changes to ASEAN's dynamics. The unity and influence it once held have become notably weakened, creating a shifting landscape in the region. This transformation presents us with a crucial window of opportunity to reassess our strategies and assert our own stance and response. Considering the evolving situation, it is imperative for us to seize this moment and take decisive actions. Rather than merely reacting to ASEAN's moves, we must be proactive and forward-thinking in shaping our own path. It is high time that we consider establishing a robust economic union of our own, a coalition that aligns with our own national interests and promotes regional prosperity. Nonetheless, as we embark on our journey, it is crucial to approach our tasks with careful consideration and strategic planning. We must ensure that our policies are inclusive, fostering an environment of mutual benefit and cooperation among member states. This will be essential to attract participation and garner support from diverse economies within the region. Workers of the world unite? What? So, member of the Southeast Asia Mutual Economic Assistance Organization. So, slightly better consumer goods, better factory output, and trade deal opinion manufacturer. Sure. Foundation of C S E A M E L. 
This morning, the Social Republic of Vietnam is proudly seen the forefront in establishing the Southeast Asia Mutual Economic Assistance Organization. <clears throat> The founding foundation ceremony held in Hanoi witnessed a participation of high-level delegates from the Democratic Republic of Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. With the fall of Thailand impacting ASEAN's unity and influence, Vietnam saw an opportune moment to establish an economic alliance that would expand its influence in the region. Addressing a gathering of dignitaries, General Secretary Nong Doc Man stated, SCAMEAO represents a momentous step forward towards a prosperous and harmonious Southeast Asia. Our shared commitment to addressing common challenges, tackling poverty, and embracing sustainable development will shape the future of our region. So basically, a mini version of Comic-Con? It's looking better, but still. And with the reunification of Yugoslavia. South Slavs, you know, once more, look at that. Well. Better consumer goods, a globalized economy, autarky, well. But the way we're going, it doesn't look like autarky is really the way we want to go. We're trying to expand out with a globalized economy. Hopefully we can start making some things. Oh, and Iraq is not doing so well. They need us. Oh man, it's a really give and take here. Establishment of the com party committee of the central business. <coughs> Understanding the thoughts, sentiments, and aspirations of enterprises, especially in areas undergoing restructuring and reorganization, needs to be a matter of concern and timely direction for party committees to resolve difficulties and her issues arising from the grassroots. Hence, the Politi Bureau has issued a decision, something, on the establishment of the party committee of the central business sector. The committee's following functions, leading, directing, inspecting, and supervising the party committees under its authority to strictly adhere to the party's political line. Party statutes, resolutions, directives, and state laws. Effectively fulfilling political tasks and organizational work, cadre affairs building clean and strong party committees, socio-political organizations, developing strong and efficient enterprises, units. Participating in research and proposing to the central committee on party work, Organizational work, cadre affairs, and political tasks of enterprises, units within the committee. Furthermore, the party committee must ensure that enterprises take proper care of the livelihoods, employment, income, and rights of workers, preventing labor disputes, petitions, and prolonged grievances, preventing officials, party members, and workers from being incited to violate the law, participate in demonstrations, protests, strikes, or arrests. Enterprises must play a leading role in the market, effectively implement monetary policy, provide capital to meet economic needs, serve as an important tool for the state to regulate and stabilize the macro economy, Go with market fluctuations, curb inflation, and contribute significantly to national defensive and security tasks, national target programs on sustainable poverty reduction, job creation, and social security. Interesting. And in just industrialization in 20 years, and followed up with the 10th Party Congress after we do a bunch of uh, military stuff, launch modernization campaigns. Our homeland is the sea. Our mind. Unrest in Thailand again. Despite the Thai's government efforts and propaganda counterinsurgency with their support, we have a public outrage is spreading across Thailand, causing serious unrest. The remnants of the Royal Army, or whatever they call themselves, the National Salvation Front, have exploited what the new economic agreement among Southeast Asian countries and portrayed it as an agreement that makes Thailand economically enslaved and dependent. They successfully succeeded in inciting riots among the people, while simultaneously bolstering the ranks as well as expanding the scope of activities. Currently, the Thai military and police forces are on the highest alert and ready to act at any time. Worrying. Aren't mine. What on earth is happening? <clears throat> the voice echoed sternly in the General Secretary's office. Let's call Mon, somewhat off guard, and after a moment of adjustment, he responded calmly, Comrade, what are you talking about? Why, why are you letting party members get involved in the private economy? It goes against everything we stand for, against everything we want to protect. The voice remained unabated. After signaling the secretary to leave the room, Mon replied, In essence, it will attract the support of entrepreneurs, creating conditions for development and expanding the middle class. I doesn't explain what you're doing, though. It is extremely paradoxical to think that we would admit capitalists to expand the social base, the mass base for the socialist revolution. The worker, peasants, soldiers, and the children of the working class will be immediately asking us, so whose party are you? He gestured towards the portrait of President Ho Chi Minh hanging above the desk with reverence. Look at Uncle Ho here, who fought for years to eradicate exploitation, and now you bring it back with a serious ethical decline of the party. It's impossible to both be a communist fighter and advocate for the abolition of exploitation, while also being a capitalist boss who thrives on profit from exploitation. Comrade, I must remind you that one part of the star on our flag symbolizes the entrepreneurs, Mahan replied. As West now cared a sense of annoyance, I don't want to argue with you right now. Please step back if there's nothing more important to report. We can discuss further in the Secretariat meeting next week. The other person gritted his teeth, but ultimately relented. With a somewhat disdainful glance, he exited the room, accompanied by the not so subtle sounding of the door closing. Nothing really important, of course. Johnny, can you just take him out? Yeah, we're still at war with Japan, which is really annoying. When are you guys going to unify? State of Dago, which is over here, which we still are kind of dealing with, you know. Chaos in Thailand, again. The chaos in Thailand has <clears throat> completely exceeded the control of the central government. Under the call of the National Salvation Front, numerous protests and even armed uprisings have erupted nationwide. 
It could be considered that Thailand is falling into civil war when the government in Bangkok is still too young. Lacking the necessary support of people and strong foundations, we must intervene to help this new ally. Um. Are we at war with them? Okay, so we have to do something here to make sure that we can actually go to war with them too. So, which really sucks, but whatever. We'll see what we can do. And so, I did some funky stuff. Uh, let's just say that we can send volunteers now. But, uh... Yeah. Um, oh, there goes Korea. End of the Eight Great, end of the Eight Great Asian War. Um, oh, the East Asia Treaty Organization One. Look at that. Hey. Um, just because we were at war with Japan and whatnot, so um, I had to do something so we can get actually back to peace. Uh, so don't worry about it. At least now we're at peace. Um, let's take a look. See, you know what? Screw it. You can have that too. Go in, have fun. You can probably do this too. Because uh, I really want to make sure that these guys are successful. I mean, we're trying to make all the economies successful. Democratic Republic of Thailand, I mean, why wouldn't we want to be successful, you know? So we're going to focus on the areas here that we can. And um, Southeast Asia is very important to us, obviously. Good. 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 Because we want to have fun with this, you know? We don't just don't, and reading events is great and all, but sometimes I want a little more than just reading events. If I wanted just to read events, I probably would play a novel or some sort of game. Or TNO, I guess. Nice job, guys. Now you're going to come over here and help us win. Nice job, nice job. We got some Thai volunteers. Launch modernization campaigns. We're going to go with the military first. ANC wins first Azania elections. Very cool. Um, so, oh, you're up there. Well, you might be able to do that. Soviet invasions of former SSRs, okay. Latvia, Estonia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, yes. You keep these guys in place, perhaps? Oh, we're out of fuel, too. We have some, like, oh, we have four consumer goods. Look at that. Daily gain, negative 2100. Base gain, wow. Well, maybe we shouldn't be on free trade anymore. All right, so we have next. Elite has the army. Hurts consumer gets a lot. Promote streamlining process. Hurts consumer gets even more. A mobile force. You get more motorized armor attack. Mechanized attack. Destroys your consumer goods for the rest of the campaign. Or a popular army. Get more organization. Cover rate defense. Worst division. Special forces division training time, which is not a real big deal for us. More population. You lose a little bit more political power. Get a little more defense. You get more infantry attack and defense, which makes more sense for me. For me. But I want to elite as the army. Probably doesn't make any sense for us for a mobile warfare, but. Whatever. Very nice. <coughs> Very good. Can we go in here? Make them really move some divisions around and whatnot. They're getting there. Oh no, are we trying to cut them off? Well, the goal is to destroy their organization, so. Swaziland, alrighty. Hey, but we actually have a fighter. Look at that. Maybe we can get to the skies. Successfully, too. Oh, we need way more production. Production base isn't just not good enough. Can we get across the river, perhaps? That'd be nice. Yes, sir. Nice, good, good. Uh, stream, promote the streamlining process, yes. Oh, oh. 
So we have Invasion New Eastern Europe, look at that. Very nice, very good. Good luck, Soviets. Don't think you'll need it, but whatever. Still learn. NATO intervenes, oh boy. Well, hopefully it doesn't land in us getting nuked, but whatever. Uh, basic international trade, sure. Well, since they're uh, not defending this too easily, or too heavily, let's see what we can do. And we're in. Very nice, very nice. Counterattack, please, yes, thank you. Good. See what you can do. You might actually lose here, but that's alright. You're learning, you're learning, you're learning. Dealing a lot of soft attack, and that's okay. Let's move around. So, with you doing this... Oh! Looks like your rock is not doing well. No, oh, we tried. A mobile force, why not? No more speed. Oh, and they have a bunch of puppets now. I thought NATO was going to interfere. Restoration of the Warsaw Pact, but... Okay, NATO has... Oh, oh this is Dmitry Azov. Um, I guess it means nothing, then. Yugoslavia's looking nice and thick. Well, so much for NATO. If Russia attacks, they do nothing, I guess. And then what? Reform the general staff? Sure. A little more skill, a little more planning. <coughs> and a small little coup in the Bundeswehr. And look at that. Do they have extra war support or anything here? Because they're taking forever to get rid of. They have a little bit. No stability. Oil shortage. Public policing, containment of communism, American backing, of course. Uh, nation, oh, National Salvation Army. Ah, better, way better surrender limit and division attack in court territory. That makes sense. And they have an oil shortage, too. See what you can do. Nice. Good stuff. Good stuff. Nice job, guys. Oh, wait. Are you still fighting? Oh, there's a Republic of Thailand, and Democratic Republic of Thailand. Oh, when do you guys get here? Strange. And I guess follow in sky, air superiority, to support the soldiers on the ground, and upgrade anti-air. Our homeland is a sea, surface fleet, subdivisions, and then fortify the islands. That's not too bad, though. Well, I guess Chechia had a uh, failed revolution too, unfortunately, you know, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, a lot of, a lot of communist support over there, same as ever. Uh, but the Yugoslavia took out Albania and ate up Bulgaria, so... Oh, and they actually joined the common turn, look at that. Or, uh, <clears throat> I mean, Warsaw Treaty Organization, the WTO, so World Trade Organization. That is a fat Yugoslavia, I love how fat that Yugoslavia is. Anyways, uh, but we're trying to upgrade our anti-air systems right now too. But we're still hanging out here, having a good old time. We're going building towards a social society. Now, truth be told, like we've had some issues this campaign. We've had no political power. We've had no uh, consumer goods. So I I do use consequence because I wanted to see what would happen. So, oh wait, what happened here? We were supposed to get something else here too. Uh, I guess this is what we got in the end. Towards a social society, yeah. Better political power, money, population, consumer goods factors, stability, war support. So I guess I already finished. All right, so we have army modernization. The army of Vietnam needs to keep up with advancing technology if it wants to keep up with an effective fighting force. Modernize weapons. We need more infantry equipment. Okay. Advanced artillery technology. Interesting. Advanced support weapons. Cement air superiority doctrine. Um, I don't know. That'd be good to get. And cement battlefield support doctrine. Well, that'd still be good to get too, but it's not, you know, the end of the world if we don't get it. So, it is what it is. Mm, I guess, like I said, up next. Ooh, that's good. Uh, the 10th Party Congress? It's time for a party, y'all. It's time for a big ol' fat party. 
Shogun Wapo, why not? And what do we get do for the Congress? Let's see. General Secretary Nguyen Van An, or we'll probably go with uh, General Secretary Nguyen Phu Throng, which some people asked me to get because uh, it's kind of cool. I think he was recently alive too, or something like that in our timeline. So, and then oh, tenth National Congress of the, Viet of the Communist Party of Vietnam. As the 10th party Congress unfolds our nation's journey through a series of events from the last Congress, it feels like a recurring pattern in the last century. Through a noble struggle and even enduring economic sanctions, yet we've managed to weather these challenges and emerge stronger. What well, unwavering determination, our path that is destined for triumphant and luminous future. Very well. A small talk between friends. I had fallen over the streets of Hanoi, but the lights in the General Secretary's office at Nguyen Khan Stran Street remained on. Nong Dok Man sat alone in his office, his mind racing. The party congress was approaching, and his support within the party was alarmingly low. Where did I go wrong? He wondered. He had fought a battle, he won a darn war, but the victory now felt hollow. Suddenly, a soft knock at the door pulled him back to reality, collecting himself. He cleared his cell. Come in, he called. Uh, yeah. The door opened to reveal a Fan Din, head of the Central Organization Commission, political bureau member, and close ally of Ma within the party, or at least that's what he think. Oh, comrade Fan Din, what brings here you at this hour? Jeb Bush! Look at that. Anyways. Uh, the workday is over. Long over, Mon said, its tone lacking enthusiasm. Comrade General Secretary, I know you're unhappy about my decision to step down as the next party congress, but allow me to speak frankly. Whether I am remain in the political bureau or not, the outcome is likely to unchange. Besides, the Central Committee decided before the last congress not to re-elect anyone over 65, Dean replied calmly. Wonderful, it's like a bomb to drop to my office, Mon thought. But he decided to try his persuading Dean anyways. It's not like he has anything to lose now. Everything's still under control. I'm certain I'll be, I'll be nominated at the next Central Committee meeting. You'll be nominated for either the position of National Assembly Chairman or Prime Minister, so there's no need to worry about re-election. I truly have no faith that it will happen. I'm sorry, Comrade Dean responded. And just like that, uh, Mons <clears throat> attempted failed. He was nowhere. He was now nearly isolated in the political arena, facing those who sought to unseat him. So he really came to my office at nearly 10 p.m. just to tell me this. Mon asked, frustrating frustration creeping into his voice. In part, yes. But I also wanted to seriously suggest that you consider retirement under the normal procedure. The last thing we need is to add fuel to the divisions within the party and inside factionalism. Inside, or man's side. Again, again, these Orana were trying to persuade him. He raised his hand to cover up his eyes, closing them tightly, and thought, He's really tired, tired of everything. Now it's going to be a long night. I did not know you could get Jeb Bush. Ooh. Oh, I have to play as America. Oh, I have to play as America next. Maintain the Reagan Party. Shift towards neoconservatism. Does anyone like neocons? American patriotism. That's a lot of war support. A fair error system. Together for victory. City on a hill. That's pretty normal. Ju -ju -ju -ja Bush. Yeah, we'll see what happens. It might be time to play as them. The General Secretary election. Following Comrade Nong Duk Man's announcement of resignation, the Congress is poised elected a new General Secretary to lead the party. The leadership transition has garnered significant attention, with two standout candidates vying for the position. First candidate, Nguyen Van An, is a seasoned revolutionary with a track record of dedication and service. His pragmatic and sagacious policies have earned him widespread support from both reformists and conservatives alike. Nguyen Van An's ability to strike a balance between various factions within the party underscores his suitability for the role of general secretary. On the other hand, the second candidate, Nguyen Phu Throng, has gained prominence for his unwavering commitment to modernizing the administrative apparatus. His pledge to root out corruption and enhance transparency within the party has resonated with, with many members. Nguyen Phu Throng brings a dynamic vision for reform, emphasizing the need for a clean and efficient governance structure. As the Congress voting approaches, the choice between these two candidates symbolizes a crossroad for the party. Nguyen Van An embodies continuity and a balanced approach, while Nguyen Phu Throng represents a potential for radical transformation and crackdown on corruption. The decision made during this election will undoubtedly shape the trajectory of the party in the nation's future. Throng? But on. Okay, so this path is unconstant yet, which means we've got to go with you. CPV elect new general secretary. Despite achieving a uh, victory in Indochina, Vietnam went through a difficult period of civil strife with economic hardships and internal instability due to the sanctions imposed by the U.S. and the West. As a result, Nong Duc Man had to resign as general secretary on the eve of the 10th National Congress of the Communist Party of Vietnam. During the Congress, the political bureau elected Nguyen Phu Throng as a new general secretary, which was seen as an ideological choice since Throng had previously served as a chairman of the Central Theoretical Council. In his inauguration ceremony, the new general secretary pledged to crack down on corruption and address domestic challenges firmly. Interesting. Uh, a Central Steering Committee for Anti-Corruption. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at my political power. Establishment of Central Steering Committee for Anti-Corruption. Oh. So we get new advisors. Political advisors following Fat Barricade, Super Goods. Throng Thruong Tan Song, more political power. And Tran Dai Kwong gets more stability. And is directly hired. All right, well. Oh, they'll do all right. Oh, look at this guy. Oh, that goes Finland. You're not NATO, are you? I don't think they're NATO in real life, are they? Maybe they are. 
the reason why I joined NATO. In response to the rampant corruption issues during this morning's session, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Vietnam has passed a decision to establish the Central Steering Committee for Anti-Corruption, with Comrade General Secretary Nguyen Phu Thuong appointed as a chairman of the steering committee. This committee will bear responsibility to the Politburo and Central Committee in directing, coordinating, inspecting, and promoting anti-corruption and anti-negative activities nationwide. By creating the Central Steering Committee and placing it under the leadership of Comrade General Secretary Nguyen Phu Thuong, the government aims to address corruption more effectively and send a strong message and signal that corruption practices will not be tolerated. The committee's task will likely include investigating and prosecuting corrupt officials, implementing preventative measures, enhancing transparency in government operations, and fostering a culture of integrity within the public sector. A step towards to the right path. Blazing Furnace Campaign. Ooh, we get more political power. I like that. Denounce Revisionism. Ooh, we get 10% here, though. Oh, I gotta go this one, then. Denounce Revisionism. And then Blazing Furnace Campaign. But well, we have the event of uh, revisionism in uh, Vietnam. Oh, we have two. We have two. But finally, work with something here. All right then. Better get a shells. We like that. In Vietnam, revisionism lacks economic, political, and social cultural foundations to exist in as in ism. Instead, it exists as a viewpoint, an unstructured and inconsistent set of thoughts expressed through words, writings, and actions of certain individuals and non legal organizations in the 30s. A notable group of these revisionists, including figures like Ta Thu, Tao, Thran Van Tach, Fan Van Hum, oppose the policies of the Indo Chinese Communist Party, simultaneously employing slogans and tactics to deceive and attract the masses, creating the illusion that they were revolutionaries. This was essentially opportunistic political maneuvering. Timely criticism and struggle against the subversive activities of those revisionist groups in Vietnam were led by Nguyen I. Quoc, who stated, The Trotskyites are not only the enemies of communism, but also enemies of democracy and progress. They are the worst traitors and spies, especially in the early 1980s, when our nation faced profound economic and social crises, our party initiated the renewal process. During this period of immense national difficulties, some individuals outwardly enforced renewal but devi deviated from socialist principles. They banned the socialist orientation by advocating for changing direction and mindset, which amounted to a form of ideological betrayal. Presently, despite the achievements, uh, we have also many limitations and shortcomings in the international regional contracts that are latent destabilizing factors, and also forces are intensifying their efforts to undermine the Vietnamese revolution. This provides fertile grounds for revisionist ideas to emerge like mushrooms after the rain. In face of significant challenges and slow resolution of some of our nation's problems, <clears throat> certain revisionist elements argue that the Communist Party of Vietnam erred in choosing the socialist path. They view Marxism-Leninism as a mere propaganda and an idea which must be abandoned. They contend that Marxism-Leninism was just a means to be an end, and now that an objective of national independence has been achieved, it should be abandoned. A common tactic of revisionist elements include distortion, vilification, and the deliberate misrepresentation of our history, especially the glorious achievements of the Vietnamese Revolution. Some intellectuals, including historians, have been compromised, abandoning their class perspective, their part, and their objectivity when studying history. They intentionally rewrite history to sanctify historical figures, denigrate the party, and speak ill of the Communist Party of Vietnam. At the same time, they romanticize and promote those who collaborated with the enemy, those who owe a blood debt to our people, and so on. These issues highlight the resurgence of revisionist thought in Vietnam today, possessing a real threat that needs to be acknowledged and countered in a timely manner. The wind of history has come. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's really red. That's so red, it's dark. Soviet occupation forced Finland. Yeah, that's a cool flag. Vladimir Bodrev. Bodrev. Interesting. Nu recent nuclear bomb damage. Oh boy. Seychelles, huh? Interesting flag, Seychelles. Target the Saigon clique. That's right. Target the Saigon clique. That's right. That's right. Um, the party infighting is just killing us right now, though. And civil discontent. Wait, do you still have civil discontent? This embargo doesn't help. Oil shortage. Uh, once we get that, we can get fuel back. Target the Saigon clique. Ho Chi Minh City, the industrial powerhouse of the country, is not only a prosperous city, but also the pride of achievements made during the Doi Moi period, however. Along with the commercial development of Saigon comes a serious moral and political decay of the current leadership, which creates conditions for potential danger such as economic crimes, corruption, or even the monopolization of the market by ruthless and rootless capitalist interests. To prevent this, we need firm corrective actions, meaningful change in the leadership of Saigon, and ensure that the platforms set by the central government are rigorously enforced. Interesting. And the Vietnamese path, socialism. Hey, look, there's actual words here. The two Ho Chi Minh's, one is a person. The first president of the Republic and the eternal chairman of the Communist Party of Vietnam, the illustrious son of the Vietnamese land, and who dedicated his whole life to the struggle for independence and freedom for the fatherland. The second is an ideal, a principle akin to truth. 
enduring through time, an ideal that light, guiding the Vietnamese people towards the truth, liberation, towards socialism and communism. Sweden joins Zeno, saw that one coming. And we finally remove party infighting. Ah, party. On criticism and self-criticism in the party. <coughs> Since the foundation of the first international communist organization, self-criticism and criticism, have been credited by the founders of Marxism and Leninism as essential for the operation and development of the party, the nature of the Revolutionary Party. This is because in progress, or in the process of evolution and development, weaknesses and de defects arising within the party are inevitable. Struggling to solve these problems and create high unity is very necessary, but this should absolutely not be done through violence or purge, but through self-criticism and criticism. Lenin considered self-criticism and criticism the immutable law of the development of a genuine and revolutionary party, he said. Revolutionary parties perished because of egoism. They did not see clearly what made their strength and hesitated to speak of their weaknesses. As for us, we will not perish, because we are not afraid to speak about our weaknesses, and we will learn the way to overcome them. And that party officials and members are also human, not angels, not saints, not heroes, but humans like everyone else. They do have flaws, the party will correct them. However, while exercising self-criticism and criticism, most party members have not yet fully recognized their shortcomings and mistakes, but often shifted responsibility to collective and objective causes. Criticism must be done based on comradeship and mutual love. Honest and sincere self-criticism and self-criticism are always the criteria for assessing the attitudes, motivation, personality, and morality of each cadre and party member. In order to make it effective, it is compulsory that democracy be promoted. People are encouraged to speak out their opinion about cadres, and subordinates are encouraged to comment and criticize their superiors, not just top-down criticism. Only by this way will democracy be promoted and criticism will be fully and effectively implemented. You must never forget what President Ho Chi Minh has taught us. A party that conceals its flaws is a corrupt party. A party that bully acknowledges its shortcomings, outlines them, understands why those flaws exist, examines the circumstances that give rise to these flaws, and then seeks every way to rectify these shortcomings is a progressive, courageous, confident, sincere party. From central to grassroots level. Cool. Or, as I should say, the Milox say, interesting. Civil discontent. Um, yeah. That's really screwing us over. What's our goal? What is socialism and how to achieve socialism? That's a question our party is always pondering, deliberating, and investigating in order to gradually improve our guidelines of viewpoint and organize for their implementation as a satisfy the particular conditions of Vietnam. As we are well aware that socialism is usually understood in three aspects, socialism is a doctrine, socialism is a movement, and socialism is a po polity. Each aspect has different manifestations depending on the world outlook and development level in a specific historical period. Then how shall we define socialism and chart the course towards socialism in a manner suitable to the particular condition and characteristics in Vietnam? Previously, while the Soviet Union and other socialist countries existed in the world, the question of advancing towards socialism in Vietnam seemed beyond doubt and implicitly validated. However, after the collapse of the socialist model in many Eastern European countries and the decline of the World Revolution, the advancement towards socialism was once again put into question and became the topic for every discussion, even drawing heated debate. Anti-communism and political opportunists rejoiced and seized that opportunity to spread misinformation and subvert the movement. Within the revolutionary ranks, some succumbed to pessimism and doubt. They questioned the validity of socialism, attributing the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact to Marxism, Leninism's flaws, and socialism's path. They advocated for the alternative direction. Others echoed hostile views, criticizing socialism and glorifying capitalism. Some even renounced their faith in Marxism, Leninism, and socialism. <coughs> Yet, amid this tumult, we stand firm undeterred by the tempest of doubts. For in the crucible of adversity, our resolve only strengthens, our vision clearer. Our this question remains, but is this the reality? Has Vietnam erred in its path? This is it our way? Our path is socialism. We acknowledge that capitalism has never been as global as it is today and has achieved significant accomplishments, particularly in the liberation and development of productive forces and the advancement of science and technology. Developed capitalist countries, based on high economic conditions and the struggles of the working class and laboring people, have implemented measures to create progressive social welfare systems, yet, yeah. among the grandeur of these achievements, the masses languish in the shadows of dwindling livelihoods, surging unemployment and widening chasms of disparity, fueling discord among desperate ethnic kin, ethnic tumult spills into the social sphere, sparking waves of protest strikes and shaking the entire system. The reality shows that the free market system of capitalism cannot effectively address these difficulties and, in many cases, cause a serious harm to poor countries deepening global conflicts between labor and capital. The once revered economic doctrines once lauded by bourgeois voices and hailed as a paragons of wisdom lie dismantled and their eminence crumbles beneath the weight of reality. Therefore, we can affirm that the path we've chosen, the path towards socialism, is not a mistake. To achieve this goal, we must promote industrialization and modernization, connecting our country's development to the growth of a knowledge-based economy, develop a market-oriented socialist economy, build an advanced culture and build the national identity shape of society where people will enjoy well-being, freedom, and happiness with opportunities for comprehensive development, ensuring equality among ethnic groups, fostering unity and mutual support, establish a social state ruled by the people, for the people, and of the people. 
The Communist Party of Vietnam stands as the beacon of the working class and its essence entwined with the aspirations of the laboring masses and the destiny of our nation. Guiding the ship of state, we will stand as the people's vanguard, the torchbearer of our collective dreams, and the guardian of Vietnam's town and spirit. For generations yet unborn to tread the hollow grounds of the liberty's domain. There is a legend, in our country as well as in China, on the miraculous Book of the Wise. When facing great difficulties, one opens it and finds a way out. Leninism is not only a miraculous Book of the Wise, a compass for us Vietnamese revolutionaries and people, it's also the radiant sun illuminating our path to final victory, to socialism and communism, by Ho Chi Minh. That's the end of the Nguyen Phu Throng Path, thank you for playing. And overall, Thank you to the devs for developing, uh, you know, Vietnam and the Red Dusk. It's a pretty good campaign. However, the, I mean, as we saw throughout this, there might be a few bugs, a few tweaks in here that the devs may look at, which I hope they do, because it's not perfect, but it's it's not a bad. This has a this is a pretty good path, I would say, and I've, I've severely enjoyed it. Um, out of all the countries I've played so far, this is probably the roughest path I've played at the time of recording on the September sometime September 2024. So, regardless, I know the mod is going to probably get more updates. It's going to get even better and better and better, and I look forward to more. Uh, content updates and refinement so if you enjoy the campaign though please consider leaving a like subscribe if you're new check out my discord link in the description below and i will see you tomorrow in another campaign thanks for watching have a great rest of your day